I don't know about you guys, but over the last decade, I've coached many a bodybuilder through the protein in the urine scare back to good health by recommending yeah. them to keep their estrogen in a range, looking into their oxidative stress, their blood pressure, and uh, using something like estragalus root extract to lower the inflammation around the kidneys. Now, it doesn't mean that it always gets resolved. I think a slight amount of albumin in the urine is livable. Of course, it's not ideal, but if you see a protein plus one on your urinalysis, that's when I would start to worry. Yeah, I've had my fair shares of ultrasounds and MRIs on the kidney because, you know, creatinine super high, 1.95 at, at, at my highest. When it was very, very heavy and doing too many sets to failure and taking too much creatine. Um, and then you realize when you do more research, and this is what many bodybuilders go through, right? First, you, you, you do your creatinine test, you get your EGFR, it's like 50 or something like that. Um, and, and the doctor is giving you the fear uh, mongering, uh, uh, preachy, uh, you know, talk that uh, you're going to die. And then later on, you realize that, okay, creatinine can be elevated from training intensity and yep. poor hydration and creatine supplementation. And, um, you know, uh, of course, you can look into other biomarkers regarding your kidney health, like creatine phosphokinase, blood urea nitrogen, and cystatin C, or the asymmetrical dimethyl arginine. Arginine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So that one, um, that's what you find out later, because general practitioners never bring that to the forefront, you know. Now, now some of the TRT clinics talk about cystatin C and A, as, uh, what is it, ADMA, I A S M A. SMA, SMA. I don't. I can't remember what it is off the top, but it's a marker of oxidative stress. No, the ASMA, the uh, asymmetric dimethylarginine. Oh, I, 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 oh, ADMA. Sorry, ADMA. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So later on, you you figure out that that's actually the correct way to keep track of it, and and uh, protein in your urine. Mm -hmm. That's an early indication. So I don't know about you guys, but over the last decade, I've coached many a bodybuilder through the protein in the urine scare back to good health by recommending yeah. them to keep their estrogen in a range, looking in their, into their oxidative stress, their blood pressure, and uh, using something like estragalus root extract to lower the inflammation around the kidneys. Now, it doesn't mean that it always, get, always gets resolved. I think a slight amount of albumin in the urine is livable. Of course, it's not ideal, but if you see a protein plus one on your urinalysis, that's when I would start to worry. Um, yeah, so have I you think... guys seen that? And then, you know, how reversible is that? Well, what have you done to kind of improve the conditions of these bodybuilders? Because it's it's still happening when it should, shouldn't. Right? It shouldn't happen anymore. I guess what you've touched on there is the, the size of the protein. So mm -hmm. when we're looking at detecting creatinine in the urine, creatinine is a tiny little molecule. And then the next step up is the statin C, which is even bigger. So if you put into Google, anyone watching this, if you put creatinine molecular shape or molecular size, the statin molecular size and an albumin, you'd see the difference in the, the difference in the gradient of size of yeah. the, the amino acid structure. With albumin, I guess at that point, if you have a big giant protein not being filtered, back into the bloodstream by the kidney. So the kidney should ba basically be quite selective in what it filters. If you have a big, massive hole that's allowing the, the albumin to pass down into urine collection, I think once you've got a level of albumin urea, as in you've got albumin versus protein urea, it's going to be quite difficult to reverse repairing like the analogy with the spider web where you've got a big giant hole in the spider web and um, at that point you're probably best off playing to your strengths and removing some of the stuff that's going to put pressure on the kidneys themselves so that filtering capacity so that's where some of the myths of high protein intakes being damaged into the kidneys come from because obviously if you've got albumin urea in your your urine and you're eating a very high protein diet, you're creating albumin within the body, which is then passing into your urine. So it's coming as a direct artifact of your nutrition. So you reduce your protein. Of course, you're going to have less protein in your urine then, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a high protein diet mm -hmm. is the cause for having the kidney disease in the first place. Yeah. Or that you'll fix um, your kidneys somehow. Yeah. 
in the meantime. Correct. <laughs> you're just leaking and, less and because you consume less. Correct. And I'd sort of, I think at that point, your strategy is to almost, I wouldn't say cheat the result, but you've got a damaged kidney, which is going to be quite difficult to repair. So your strategy is basically, how can I preserve the function of the, the kidney as it is now versus repairing the kidney? So it's not like the liver where we know the liver has those BMSC stem cells that can come in and repair the liver to an extent. It's very, very unlikely that you're going to get stem cell infiltration into repair nephrons that have been damaged. Um, like a nephron, if you look at the anatomy of a nephron versus the anatomy of like a, a hepatocyte, a liver cell, their nephrons are so complex and that you've got at least 10 distinct sections to it that are doing different jobs based on the point along the nephron. It's not just like a, a liver cell. It has CYP enzymes. Mm. It produces bile. It's a very relatively simple cell. The nephron, you know, has... A filtering capacity as a reabsorption, you know, it's tightly controlling the, the blood volume. It's correcting blood volume drops with renin. It's retaining sodium. It's excreting potassium, you know, and it's regulating glucose. There's so many different things to it that I just, once it's damaged, your, your best strategy is offsetting further damage than, oh, I'm going to fix my kidneys. And like I said, when people see these, Changes in creatinine, creatinine falls from removing creatine and not training to failure, not eating a high protein diet, some antioxidants. Yeah, of course, the on paper, the EGF4 is going to go up because it's a calculation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the actual physical structure is repaired itself. At, you know, at that point, to be honest, when you've got some level of kidney disease or kidney damage, bloods are useful to sort of monitor a track and progression of the disease, but really using something like CT scans of the kidneys or, or ultrasounds yeah. to track the physical progression of the organ in real time is really a better solution. Um, you know, like you, you, you brought up anyone listening to this that's sort of worried about kidney health for what they're doing. A hundred urine test strips on Amazon costs about $9. <laughs> you know, True. Yeah. And, and, you know, and that, like for the cost of like nine cent a test, you could do one test every day and it's three months covered. What are you talking like $45 to cover yourself for the year? Not even at $36, four quarters. You know, it's, it's a very inexpensive way. And then if you want, whenever you see your primary care physician, get them to do a, a, an advanced ACR right. test where they actually look at albumin to creatinine ratio of your urine to give you an even better insight. Yeah. Yeah. You can also do a 24 hour urine collection test. I would recommend everybody to do that twice a year. It's very cumbersome, obviously, because if you drink like four to six to eight liters of water, you have to collect all of it. You can't miss a drop because that's how they get the actual glomerular filtration rate based on your urinary cystadency and urinary creatinine levels compared to what's in your blood. Um, and if you miss a one urine, then obviously the calculation is not going to be correct. So that's what I would recommend everybody to do at least once or twice per year. And it's cumbersome, um, but it's less cumbersome than going in for an MRI or a CT scan. You know, this you could do from the comforts of your home. You bring a bag with you to the gym. If you pee there and then you collect everything and just throw in a big uh, jug and then take it with you to the clinic, let's say... Look at all the urine I produced. Aren't you proud of me? <laughs> I got like one time, I got like 10 liters. It was disgusting. <laughs> so, and then I did the the ultrasound, right, to see if anything was going on. I had one of those, you know, health uh, preaches from the doctor after my creatinine was like 1.9. Um, so I did the 24-hour urine collection test and an ultrasound and everything came back normally. And you see that the funny thing is the EGFR can be super low. And then you do the, the actual GFR based on the creatinine from your urine mm -hmm. and your the uh, the blood uh, the blood results, and then you see okay creatinine is high in my blood, but it's also high in my urine, and it's actually filtering appropriately. Mm -hmm. You just produce a lot more, and then you check your cystadenity, and it's perfectly in line, like zero point six eight milligrams per liter, and you're like okay, I can breathe again. Uh, but I think many of these bodybuilders, including myself, you know, when you don't know yet, you you get 
yeah, you get scared and then you go through the ringer of all these tests. But I think it's important to keep doing that every year because, you know, blood pressure you can manage, obviously, uh, liver will regenerate, but the kidneys are, are, once it's broken, it's kind of broken forever. And I, I don't really feel that stem cells are that conclusive to make it better. And, well, you could do a, a kidney transplant, but with the rejection drugs, um, you know, and then the invasive surgery, I don't think that's a permanent solution either. And then kidneys, after a, a surgery, how long did it last? Seven to ten years? Something like that? You know, it's not like they last the rest of your life. Um yeah, so it's, it's prevention is the best cure in this sense. 